Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Christian Lash, and my pronouns are they and them. I am with the Children's Services Department, and I'm on CPL's Rainbow Pride Committee. This virtual program is part of our LGBTQ plus Pride Month series of events. For this program, it is my absolute joy to welcome distinguished author Yoon Ha Lee. A Korean American science fiction and fantasy writer who received a BA in math from Cornell University and an MA in math education from Stanford University, Yoon finds it a source of continual delight that math can be mined for story ideas. Yoon's novel, Nine Fox Gambit, won the Locus Award for Best First Novel and was a finalist for the Hugo, Nebula, and Clark Awards. Its sequels, Raven Stratagem and Revenant Gun, were also Hugo finalists. His middle grade space opera, Dragon Pearl, won the Locus Award for Best YA Novel, and it was a New York Times bestseller. Yoon's short fiction has appeared in publications such as FNSF, Tor.com, and Clark's World Magazine, as well as several years best anthologies. Yoon's middle grade space opera, Dragon Pearl, was also named one of CPL's best of the best books. Yoon joins us to discuss many topics, including identity, space operas, both children and adults, and new and upcoming books, including Dragon Pearl's upcoming sequel, Tiger Honor. With that, I'm thrilled to begin our discussion with Yoon Ha Lee. I guess um, we can dive right in if that's okay with you. Sure, absolutely. So um, as, you, as you know, um, we, I'm part of the um, Rainbow Pride Committee here at Chicago Public Library. And um, so we are doing this for um, part of our Pride Month programming. And so a natural place to start is, you know, kind of to, to talk about um, some of your um, writing and some of your characters. You know, a, a lot of your books and a lot of your stories do include queer characters. And so that, you know, kind of makes me wonder, are there, you know, other ways in which your, um, your own queer identities influence your writing? You know, it's mostly in deciding to include queer characters and queer societies. Uh, a book that was really influential to me growing up, or I guess a series of books, was Mercedes Lackey's Valdemar books, because they had, you know, they had Vaniel, who was gay, and they had a number of queer characters. And also, um, maybe not uh, the best example from a modern standpoint, but Anne McCaffrey's Pern books, because they had the uh, uh, they had various queer characters, and I thought I would like to continue that um, in writing books where char characters like myself could be seen and reflected. Yeah, I know as a non-binary person myself, I've really appreciated reading um, just all kinds of books with non-binary characters, um, and yours in particular. And the reason I say yours in particular is because. I think you do a really good job of having non-binary characters that are just people living their lives like everybody else. Um, I think a lot of queer fiction is so focused on these, you know, identities as service to the plot or identities to explore some of the, um, I guess, trauma narratives and the, the difficulties that we face in society. And those stories are absolutely important and crucial to tell. Um, but I, I really appreciate having stories like yours where non-binary and trans and queer characters are just people living their lives. 
I think one of the things that enables me to do that is that most of the time I'm telling stories set in a secondary world. So for example, if you're writing about a queer character in the 1990s, it's it's a little hard to escape some of that narrative because that acceptance wasn't a part of general society. The other thing that really made me think about this was actually not in regards to queer fiction, but a friend of mine, Rachel Brown, is a Jewish author, and she said something that really struck me, that all the books about Jewish characters when she was growing up were Holocaust or Jewish trauma narratives. And sometimes she just wanted to read about a Jewish character having adventures and just being Jewish without that, you know, their identity being, uh, you know, a Jewish I guess Jewish coming out is maybe not not the same thing, but you know their identity as trauma being a focus of the narrative. So I thought of that in regards to queer and trans and non-binary characters and said, maybe the characters can just be themselves having their own lives. Yeah. Um, so I, I know that, um, you know, in prior um, conversations, like we've talked about, um, you know, how there are more non-binary writers that are writing um, non-binary characters. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you have um, any favorite examples of not just non-binary, but any um, queer trans um, authors who are writing stories about their own communities. Uh, one of them is River Solomon, who wrote An Unkindness of Ghosts. Uh, I will say that it is somewhat heavy reading because it's a it's a colony ship that has managed to reproduce in, in sort of a um, really horrible way at the antebellum South. So it you know there's a slave plantation and there's racism against you know there's racism basically. But it's such a well written book and it really pulled me in and. Um, the one of the characters is gender variant and not neurotypical, which I really appreciated. And um, the other author, I actually don't know how to pronounce their name, so I'm gonna drop it into chat. I think it's S. Chioli Lu. And um, the book is In the Watchful City, which is actually the first book I read that not only that had multiple neo pronouns being used for different non-binary characters. And I mean, I'm not widely read, I'm a very slow reader, but it was the first time I had seen that and it worked so gracefully uh, to differentiate the different characters and their different ways of being. And I really um, appreciated that. Yeah, thank you for adding to my to be read list. Um, I have read An Unkindness of Ghosts and that was absolutely, I agree with you. It was heavy, but just such a powerful book. Um, I know Rivers has written at least one other book. I sort of lose track because as I said, I'm a slow reader, but they warned me that like their next book would have lots of fungus. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I have a fungus phobia. So I'm gonna maybe give that one a miss. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, this kind of leads to the question of um, how do you think um, stories or the um, kind of, you know, powerfulness or meaningfulness um, of stories changes um, when they are by authors who are writing about their own communities? I think you do get a certain kind of authenticity with the caveat that sometimes I get the feeling that especially in minority communities, people are expecting a particular kind of narrative. And of course, not all non-binary people have the same experience. Not all trans guys have the same experience. Not all Jewish people or Asian Americans or whatever. You know, we all have our own individual life stories. So um, I think it's important to recognize that someone can approach the same identity from, a di from many different angles. The other thing I want to be cautious about is that sometimes people ask, uh, authors for credentials in ways that can be kind of damaging. And I'm thinking of the Isabel Fall helicopter story situation where um, 
she wrote a story about uh, about gender about gender dysphoria and it was some people did not receive it well and that it finally came out she was sort of forced to disclose that she's a trans woman and I think nobody should be forced to come out as sort of a, hey, I am an authentic moment, especially when there are safety considerations involved. So I do think we have to be a little bit cautious. Uh, I mean, absolutely there are narratives out there that are not well done or that are harmfully done, but at the same time, I think demanding that people disclose to us, oh, hey, I was a rape survivor, or hey, I'm a trans guy, or hey, I am queer, sometimes people have very good reasons for not disclosing that information to the public. Yeah, I think as always, you know, when we talk about uh, marginalized identities, things can get um, very messy and very complicated in, in so yeah. many ways. Um, but I, you know, I, I do, um, I, I know I always appreciate reading um, books that are, you know, from people that are writing about their own communities, which sure. kind of leads um, into my next topic, which is, um, you know, you weave so much just beautiful folklore into um, all, pretty much all of your stories. Um, and I know I've learned a lot about um, some of that more traditional um, folklore through reading your books and then being curious and looking up, you know, some of the some of the different things. And so um, I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, some of the folklore and traditions that show up in your writing and if there's any um, uh, stories that, you know, particularly inspire you as, as you're weaving those threads into your books? You know, when I was a kid, I started out reading tons of classical mythology. That was really where it started. Like my, my dad was really into the Iliad and the Odyssey and Greek myths, and he would tell me those stories. And then I started branching out. My mom found me a book of Polynesian folktales. Um, I started reading Norse folktales. Uh, I even got some books of Korean folktales. And my parents were like, yeah, haha, ha, that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> So I, I do like to read widely. I especially loved uh, reading fairy tales and my dad was really into the ballet and there are a lot of stories like Swan Lake that got adapted for the ballet. So I just try to cast a wide net. And um, I, I do think that as I grow older, I try to work in more Korean folklore into my stories. And most of that I got from reading, I got from reading a book called Korean Folktales, uh, logically enough, by an author who uses a romanization system that I have never seen anywhere else. Like he just sort of made it up, but he would have stories about nine-tailed foxes who it, you know, Everyone thinks because of Pokemon and Naruto that not nine-tailed foxes are sort of cuddly. And in Korean folklore, they are not cuddly. They're out to sleep with you and then like tear out your liver. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, are, go ahead. Oh, there are also stories about um, folk heroes and, you know, just sort of the general the general feeling of fairy tales. I've start, I've been writing my own sort of fantasy fairy tales on my Patreon uh, for, for some of my followers. And I think there's something about a story that draws so heavily on archetypes and, you know, those big fantasy fairy tale archetypes that's really appealing. Yeah, I know. Um... Uh, fractured fairy tales are gaining a lot of, of traction as of late. Um, mm -hmm. And there have been some really well done ones. Mm -hmm. um, I think the latest one I read was um, Deep and Darkest Red, um, Anna Marie McLemore, mm -hmm. um, yep. who did a really fabulous job with the, the red shoes. Mm -hmm. um, I think the last one that really made an impression on me was Catherine Valente's uh, Deathless, which takes uh, 
I can't pronounce Russian, Koshche the deathless or heartless or whatever, however it goes, and mixes it with uh, the history of the siege uh, in World War II where the Germans come and the Russians are in there starving in their city. So it's, again, it's very heavy reading, but it's so brilliantly done. And I just love it when people take old material and make it new. Yeah. Um, I know when, when I've done outreach visits lately to, um, you know, schools um, and um, childcare groups, um, a lot of the older kids are now like asking if we have you know, books on Greek mythology or Norse mythology or all these different, you know, folk tales and mythologies. Um, and I know a lot of that was spurred by the um, popularity of Rick Riordan, which you, you know, um, uh, your middle grades books, um, Dragon Pearl, you know, were published under the Rick Riordan Presents um, imprint. Um, how, um, I'm, I'm curious, um, if you have read any other um, books that are in that imprint? I read a couple of them. I have read, uh, which one? The first Arusha book, which was really funny. And the first one by Jennifer Cervantes. And then I had to stop the uh, Sal and Gabi Break the Universe by Carlos Hernandez. I had to stop reading that one, not because it was bad, but because it was so good. And there, it got to this point that was like really emotionally traumatic. I won't spoil it if you haven't read the book. And I was like, I can't continue this because this is hitting me too, too close to home. So yeah, and that, um, Kwame Mbalia's uh, Strong books. Which... Yes. Tristan Strong is actually next on my, <laughs> on my file. Yeah, yeah. So really great stuff. I just, uh, you know, th there's one coming out every month and it takes me a month to read a book. So I just cannot keep up with how fast they're coming out. But that's a good thing, right? Yes. Good problem to have. Yes. Um, so you know, I mentioned Dragon, Dragon Pearl, and um, so for some books, we will put um, genre labels on them, like whether they're fantasy or whether they're mysteries or, you know, sci-fi, and we had so much trouble with Dragon Pearl, and I think we eventually just didn't put a genre label on it, because it's kind of this, like, sci-fi, space opera, fantasy, mystery, ghost story, folktale, like, and it, it just sounds like, you know, so odd and complicated to have all of these different threads, but it's, it's all woven together just so beautifully into this story about family and about honoring oneself. Um, I just, I, I loved it so much. And I have to give a shout out to my mom who works at a, at a book bindery. And she was actually the one who introduced me to Dragon Pearl and to your writing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm wondering um, with all of these complicated threads and genres that you weave in, is there a certain, um, you know, process that you use as you're writing to kind of keep track of all of this? I wish I could say there was, but I, I, you know, I just sort of throw ideas together into the blender and something comes out. Uh, you're mentioning the label, the genre label stickers actually makes me smile because I have this problem in my, um, in my documents folder where I categorize different writing projects. And for the longest time, I would have a science fiction folder and a fantasy folder. And anyone who's been following my writing for any length of time knows that I write a lot of science fantasy. And so instead of creating a science fantasy folder, which would be the smart thing to do, I would just at random pick either science fiction or fantasy and then like not be able to find my file <laughs> when, when I want to look for it. Now I have a middle grade folder, which I guess is just the Dragon Pearl series, but yeah, um, organization is not one of my strong points. <laughs> I, I feel your pain. Um, organization um, actually is one of my strong points, and I was a cataloger before I um, came to the public library, but 
um, there are some books and, and yours is kind of the top of the list that, that defy those um, categories, um, which I think, you know, makes it all the more interesting and powerful and also allows, um, you know, when people come in and they're looking for something new to read and you ask, okay, well, what kinds of um, genres do you like? And you kind of try to do that interview where you can find read-alikes and um, with so many, you know, genres and pieces to Dragon Pearl, it's often one that, that we can recommend um, to almost anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am just so excited for the sequel to Dragon Pearl, which I saw, um, you know, has, has, is out on, on, uh, Goodreads now. So we have a title and we have a cover. So Tiger Honor and that cover, oh my goodness, it's gorgeous. I got so lucky with the, um, with the cover artist for those books, uh, Vivian To. T.O. Uh, she was the art director for the Lego Batman movie. And oh, wow. yeah, but she does fantastic art. I've been incredibly lucky. Yeah, so um, anybody who has not seen that cover yet, um, go um, to Yoon's site or to Goodreads and, and just look at that cover. It's amazing. Um, I will say I was very interested to, to read the blurb um, because while it is a, a um, sequel to Dragon Pearl, the blurb at least um, seemed like it focused on a different um, main character. And so I was kind of curious about that. And I don't know if you're able to, to really um, talk about that a little more without um, giving spoilers. I don't think it's really a spoiler. Uh, the main character, the POV character for Tiger Honor is Sebin, who is a non-binary tiger spirit. And they are the, I'm blanking here because I don't know of a non-binary English word that is like English, that is like nephew slash niece. We're, yeah, I was gonna say there there are some different ones thrown around, but the one that um, ha is gaining the most traction is um, nibbling or niblet. Okay, yeah. um, they're the nibbling of Captain Juan from Dragon Pearl. So they've grown up with Captain Juan as their hero. And then they learn that Captain Juan has gotten into extremely terrible trouble and then Captain Juan uh, gets involved with their training crews. And um, that's when Seven meets Min and fixes on Min as the enemy. So Min does make an appearance. She's a major character. Lots of stuff happens with her, but she's not the point of view. Okay. And I wanted to do this because I wanted to write a non-binary character uh, POV in this series. I know that there are, I've written non-binary characters before as side characters, and I wanted to do one as the main character. And um, yeah, I thought it would be a good way to move the series forward without, without it feeling too much the same. I have this terrible problem that if I write a book and it feels like I'm retreading old ground, I get bored. So I have to change things up. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of leads into, you know, it, it, if uh, Steven fixes on Min as the enemy, um, you know, you saw this a little bit in Dragon Pearl, but particularly in your adult writing as well. I, I've i noticed um, that a lot of your characters are not like purely the good guys or the bad guys. Like there's a lot of, you know, moral, moral grayness and a lot of um, complexity um, woven into um, your stories and into your um, character development. I think it makes it feel, um, to me at least, it makes it feel more real, more authentic, because none of us are, you know, purely good or purely bad, right? There's not that defining, um, you know, bold line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually really enjoy morally gray characters, or even 
all very dark gray characters, which is why I write them. It's funny because my husband prefers for there to be a clear, unambiguous hero. So he has a hard time with my books because that's not really something I do very often. Yeah, I know. Um, I, you know, I thought that that's, you know, really what I wanted is I wanted people, you know, to, to have the, those clearly defined um, roles. And then I read, um, oh my gosh, it's escaping me now. Um, Holly Black's. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Um, her Elfheim um, series. And um, the way you just couldn't figure out who was the good guy and who was the bad guy. And by the end, you're like, there really isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it was through through that, that I really developed um, a love of those morally gray characters. Um, and it was not long after um, reading that series that I um, dived into your um, adult uh, uh, novels and um, noticed that also, you know, in, in your adult novels. And so I really, um, you know, had, had a new appreciation for that moral grayness. I was once on a presentation with some of the other Rick Riordan Presents authors and Jen Cervantes says that she loves, when she decides on a main character, she loves making a hero, someone who, who is doing the right thing. And I said that I like to write someone who, who sort of starts out with a really big flaw because the thing that I find rewarding to write is those transformations arcs and the uncertainty of are they going to become a better person or are they going to slip and fall like that's what energizes me but you know there's a there are different stories for different kinds of readers which is which is the great thing about the world of books yes that arc um of of transformation as soon as you said that um i just I literally just this morning finished reading um, the second book in the um, Children of Blood and Bone. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, kind of through this entire, um, entire series, like, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out um, whether Inan, who is the, the, you know, the ruler of this um, kingdom, like, is he going to, you know, like you said, is he going to have that, you know, good transformation or is he going to fall? And we still don't know. And um, I really, you know, I think it adds a lot um, to, to the writing. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of um, starting to get into a little more of your adult writing. And speaking of gorgeous covers, I recently finished um, your, your newest um, novel Phoenix Extravagant, um, which features the um, dragon on on the cover, and that dragon just like completely stole the show in this novel. It, it was probably my favorite character. And I know we talked about um, I know we talked about pronouns earlier, and I found it interesting that that um, you know a lot of times when when uh, machines in, you know, in sci-fi are, are personified, they often get assigned gendered pronouns, but the dragon, um, was referred to as, uh, with the pronoun it through, throughout the novel. And I thought that was an interesting choice. And I wonder if you, um, have any more to, you know, to say about, uh, why that decision was made. Uh, I did it to avoid pronoun collision because Chebby, it, the main character is non-binary and they're the protagonist and the book is written in third person. So if I had two characters that were going by they pronouns that would have the potential to get confusing. And the dragon, like, what does it even mean for a robot dragon to have a gender anyway? And it is mechanical. So I decided that it would be okay to use the pronoun it. I'm reminded, uh, and I mean, this is not just non-binary or inanimate, inanimate um, robot creature <laughs> pronouns. I had a writer friend, Nancy Sauer, who once had to do a writing assignment where she was writing three female warriors um, fighting a battle in the dark. And she had to 
differentiate who was doing what at any given time without getting the reader confused with all the she's and hers running around. So the, it, it was really just for technical reasons that I decided to assign the dragon in it. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, like I said, that dragon was just my favorite part of the book. I mean, it just completely stole the show and, um, you know, added some, some real moments of levity um, in the way it interacted um, with the, with the humans around it. Um, like, you know, sentient machines and sentient ships are a relatively, um, you know, common sci-fi trope, but um, everyone you write, um, you just have such a talent for making them, you know, fresh and unique. And often the, the uh, sentient machines and ships that you write are really funny and really sarcastic. I have, I have a liking for snarky characters. It's sort of a weakness. And, the, you know, I've seen books where they make try to make the robots robotic and that's never really worked for me narratively. I mean, I have no opinion, you know, I'm not an AI researcher. I don't have an opinion on whether that's realistic, but I always find um, non-human characters more interesting when they have a distinct personality or a distinct point of view. And so I, and especially if there's a sense of humor in there as well. Yeah. Um... I really, um, it, I really appreciated the theme behind Phoenix Extravagant, um, and um, I'm going to to plug CPL's um, uh, summer learning theme a little bit here because um, our summer learning theme is focused on art, and Phoenix Extravagant fits really well um, with that theme. You know, the exploration of art for art's sake. Um, you know, the, the themes of cultural appropriation when it comes to art and this really unique um, system of magic in which art uh, is a magical tool and pigments are, are a magical tool. Um, and it felt like, you know, it felt to me like it was quite a shift from your first, um, you know, adult adult novels, the, the Machineries of Empire um, series, you know, was very math heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and yet somehow even with these um, very different themes, it all, you know, felt like your, you, you know, your style and your writing. Um, so I was wondering um, what the, inspiration was, if any, for this shift from a from a math heavy um, world to a uh, magical kind of art driven world. Sure. With Phoenix Extravagant, I was inspired by the fact that I had taken up watercolor painting. Uh, I started drawing because I have aphantasia. I can't visualize things to any meaningful degree. And I wanted to be able to see what my characters looked like. So I started drawing my characters. And I know that there are many talented artists out there. But at the time, you know, this was before my books had come out. I was broke. So it was like, if I want anyone to draw my characters, it's going to have to be me. I'm going to have to do it myself. And it just sort of went naturally from there into watercolor. I thought at one point that I was going to get by with just like six colors and that has not happened. I have a whole collection of watercolors now. Uh, and I learned about this paint called uh, quinacridone gold PO49. And the thing about quinacridone gold, which I'm probably mispronouncing, is that it actually, um, the world supply ran out. It was manufactured as a pigment for cars. Like it's this golden color and it went out of fashion. Like nobody apparently wanted gold colored cars anymore. So uh, a ma paint manufacturer called Daniel Smith bought up the world supply and used it in their paints. And this was all very fine and dandy, except like they they ran out. Like they they literally physically ran out of the chemical stockpile. And when I was a little kid playing around with my Crayola colors, it never occurred to me that you could run out of a color like that. This would be a thing. 
and if you do digital art, for example, it doesn't matter if you want to use a particular gold color or pink or gray or whatever, you can use it infinitely and it doesn't matter. But if you think about what a paint is, it's a chemical. And uh, there's no such thing as an infinite supply of any chemical. It is possible to run out. So um, there was sort of this watercolor, like panic buying of this particular color as people realized that they were out of the color. And some people, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful color. It's, it goes from this pale yellow to this deep gold and mass tone. And watercolorists were paying like upward of a hundred dollars for a half pan, uh, that kind of craziness. And it occurred to me like, uh, you know, what if you kind of made a magic system out of this where you had a scarcity of um, pigment, paint pigment created from artworks and um, you, you would have to use them up in order to create your magical effect. The other thing that uh, happened as I was writing this was that I did some research into the Japanese occupation of Korea. And I discovered that a lot of the kinds of things that I wrote about in Phoenix Extravagant actually happened. Um, the Japanese making off with uh, Korean artworks and so on. So even though um, Phoenix Extravagant is about a very different kind of character, Jebby is you know, an ordinary person who just wants to sit at home and paint. Um, the themes of imperialism and colonization are similar to some of the themes that I explore in Machineries of Empire. Sorry, yeah. that was long. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was really interesting. Um, I had no clue about the that that gold. So that was a really interesting story. Kind of like you know the toilet paper during the pandemic. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, it also kind of reminded me of um, Anish Kapoor. Um, and um, Stuart Semple. I don't know if you are familiar with those artists, you know, kind of trolling each other. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, it might be a little hard to dive into this without spoilers, but that ending. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, I mean, I as I was coming up to this ending and I was seeing how few pages were left, I was like, oh my gosh, like, there's no way this this book can wrap everything up in this last few pages. So there must be a sequel. And then the ending happened. And I got to be honest, man, that was a gut punch. That was just like, <laughs> like, like hitting a brick wall. And you know, the more, the more I sat with that ending, the more it made sense. And um, now I, you know, I think I kind of understand, you know, why you ended it in, in, in the way you did. And, and really, in order to be true to the story, there probably wasn't another way to end it. Um, but, you know, as I, as I, you know, read reviews um, about that book, it seems like, you know, it was very controversial with some, you know, really understanding it and loving it and others were just like, you know, they hated it and it ruined the book, <laughs> you know. I, I, I'm wondering if you can, you can kind of expand on, on your decision on ending it um, in that way without giving spoilers. Sure, so Chebby and um, friends, let's say friends, Chebby and friends, I wanted to give them sort of a happy ending because I got tired of this thing where the non-binary character or the queer character or whatever, you know, gets, gets broken up or unhappy ending or somebody dies or whatever. Like I did not want that to happen. At the same time, um, if you look at the historical background, the book is sort of based on the Japanese occupation of Korea. Korea was not freed because of plucky rebels. Korea was not freed because a mechanical dragon came around and you know beat up all the Japanese and drove them out. Korea uh, was freed from the Japanese occupation because the Americans came in Japan in World War II. 
Washington ended in 1945. And then, of course, things get very complicated. And five years later, we have the Korean War. But, you know, I was like, I, I'm really not up for writing, writing things that go that far into the history. But if you look at the historical background and the fact that um, outside intervention was what drove the Japanese out of the Korean Peninsula, I was like, this is the only, this is the only way I can go. So I guess, you know, we were kind of to this, this point where, you know, Phoenix Extravagant came out a few months ago, you've got Tiger Honor um, coming out in, you know, a few months from now. And so I'm wondering if, you know, you have anything else going, what's next for you and for your readers? Uh, I have a collection of fairy tales coming out in, I think, October of this month. It's called The Fox's Tower and Other Tales, and it's coming out from Andrews McNeil Publishing. And it's a, sort of a re-release plus some new stories of those Patreon flash fairy tales, which I really enjoy writing those because I write a lot of downer books, as you may have noticed. <laughs> and with the fairy tales, I really endeavor to write something short and sweet and uplifting. It's not something I really do a lot in my novel length work. So that's coming out. Um, I am working on a novel presently, but because I am waiting for the official announcement, I cannot say anything else other than I am writing on a novel and things are happening. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'm really looking forward to the fairy tales though. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, also, I also have to say, like I've I follow you on Twitter, as I'm sure many of your your uh, readers also do, and I am just like endlessly entertained by um, your cat pictures and how much your cat is involved in. Uh, it, it almost seems like your cat is very involved in your writing. Um, I also have um, what I lovingly refer to as a Velcro cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, tell it. Tell us about. Tell us about your kitty. Uh, we adopted her seven years ago because I decided I wanted a cat and we had decided that it was time we were going to do the cat thing. She's my very first cat and um, she's really friendly and not very bright. Like the first day we brought her home and we plunked her down in front of her food bowl and she flopped over, sho showed her belly and started to purr. And everyone had warned me that the belly is a trap. Do not pet the belly. But she just kept purring. So I tried petting her belly and she really liked it. This was on her first day. Like we were strangers. She had no idea who we were or if we were gonna you know, murder her for, I don't know, cat meat. So she's just a really easygoing, trusting cat, and we think she's really a dog. And the reason my Twitter feed is like 90% cat pics by volume is that, you know, some people use their Twitter to get into political discussions or... I don't know, any sort of heavy discourse. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But my observation from watching a lot of Twitter arguments is that I have never, ever, ever once seen anyone change their mind about something because of a Twitter argument. So I'm opting out. I am just going to sit here and provide cat pics to uh, bring more joy to the world. That's it. That's what I do. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I'm not... I have a Twitter account, but I'm not really on there, um, you know, a lot. Um, but my Facebook is pretty much um, half queer posts and half cat pictures. So my Facebook, my Facebook is um, sort of wall to wall, funny Facebook animal geek memes. And I, every, every two days, I call my husband and daughter in and say, hey, you have to come look at this. And they're like, oh, it's Facebook again, isn't it? And I show them all the jokes that I've accumulated. Like I'm the vector for bad Facebook memes. Yeah, my, um, my spouse and I will often, even if we're in like the same room, we'll often like text each other like memes that we've found just scrolling through um Facebook or or Reddit mm -hmm. that's that's 
definitely part of you know relationshiping is look at this funny thing <laughs> yep. I think that pretty much covers things um you know, I, I just, um, I really appreciate you um, taking the time to, to speak with us. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, um, to reading, you know, the things that you uh, have in the works. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for reaching out. Of course, thank you. So you can check out Yoon's books for free here at the Chicago Public Library, or you can visit one of Chicago's many independent bookstores to purchase a copy. This program will continue to be available on, on the Chicago Public Library YouTube page, so please encourage your friends to watch it on demand. And please visit the Chicago Public Library website for many more upcoming virtual events at shypublive.org.